from the studios at WMFE in Orlando, Florida, this is the Space Exploration Podcast asking the question, are we there yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. Thanks for listening. If we're going to go to Mars, we're going to need a new spacecraft. And that's what NASA's Orion capsule is for. It looks like the capsules of the Apollo days. Engineers say the capsule shape is perfect for deep space exploration and re-entry into the atmosphere, but it's a bit bigger than the Apollo command module. It was originally designed to hold six astronauts. Well, engineers are borrowing what they learned from the shuttle program as well. Decades of space exploration are coming together for this crew capsule. In 2014, NASA launched an Orion into a high orbit around the Earth to test the capsule's structure and the heat shield on the bottom of it. They called that the test flight EFT-1, and by all accounts, the mission was a success. Now, their sights are set on Exploration Mission 1, or EM-1 as they like to call it, an unpiloted mission set for 2018 that will send the Orion capsule into space, past the moon, and back. So what goes into designing the next big thing in space exploration, and how are engineers preparing for the next test flight? Well, Orion engineer Stu McClung gave me a call from his office in Houston to bring me up to speed on Orion and the new rocket they're designing to blast it into deep space. Stu, let's let's talk pretty broadly here. Um, what's the purpose of the Orion spacecraft? So Orion is the, is the vehicle that the agency that NASA is building really to set us up with the capability to go explore outside of low Earth orbit. Right? Uh, we've got a great program it's active today with Space Station and our commercial and international partners doing science on the Space Station right now. Orion's uh, and SLS are the pieces of the architecture that are setting the stage so that we can go to uh, places beyond that. The SLS being the space launch system. So the yeah, rocket the, that it sits on top. The of. rocket that, uh, that is being built out of uh, Marshall Space Flight Center there in Alabama. And so Orion's the capsule that the crew will launch in. Um, for any of the deep space destinations, Mars clearly is a part of our uh, part of our portfolio. One of the missions that you know that we're eventually targeting, uh, and Orion's the capsule that the crew would return back to Earth in. So I kind of want to go over the history of Orion. Um, it kind of cropped up in the the Constellation program, and then kind of transferred over to this this new focus of space exploration. Can, can you kind of talk about? Uh, the the first idea for this capsule and how it's kind of evolved to uh, to what we're planning on using uh, now. All right. Yes, so Ryan. I mean, we were part of Constellation in the beginning. In fact, I joined the program back in two thousand and late two thousand and six, early two thousand and seven. Um, and eventually, you know, its initial rec- uh, goal was to set us up uh, and do some uh, exploration of the moon. Was our original target at the time. Uh, that also evolved to include Space Station. Uh, we were going to be part of the Space Station portfolio. And then in 2010, uh, you know, the, the leadership in D.C. You know, restructured us, um, and uh, you know the program has uh, been remolded into where um, our focus is really now deep space. Uh, and um, Orion as a vehicle on its own, we um, there was a lot of debate going on about how much of the Constellation program and Orion does the agency keep in place uh, back in 2010, and um, we we already we had Padabort one ready to go, and we flew it in 2010. We had our ground test article, which is a structural representation of the vehicle. Uh, in production, and uh, so we lo- we lobbied uh, the our leadership made the case that Orion as a capsule and a vehicle was mature enough that it that we kind of carried across uh, from what what we were back in Constellation to what we are today. Right? Slightly different destinations, different missions per se. Uh, there was a lot that we had accomplished already that we've that we carried across, and we didn't you know we didn't lose that effort. Um, and so we've we've continued to mature the vehicle, and and you saw that with our uh, test flight that we flew this time last year, and we're in the process of building the structure right now that will fly on the next test flight. Coming from from that constellation concept of Orion uh, to the, to the the model that we're using now, were there any major changes, or or was it just kind of just minor tweaks, or or what you would expect it after you know five years of development? I'd say to the outside, to the general 
general public's eyes, you wouldn't see major tweaks. I mean, we had the same vehicle, same you know, the same shape, so the or the same physics were there. When we uh, eliminated missions to space station from our requirement suite, that results in changes that. Uh, you know, that those of us at the engineering ranks deal with, um, like, for example, the, uh, the the debris environment that you get when you're docked to space station versus a deep space mission is just is different. And that allows you uh, to, to basically to size things like the thickness of your tile differently. Uh, and, the, and the heating and the, uh, the thermal environments uh, can be different. And so those types of things, uh, when you have... Um, Different missions work themselves in, and so you know for the the, the engineer that's at his uh, his or her terminal and they're working hard on the design, some of those seem to be you know can be a big uh, a big challenge, but it's it's part of the maturing of the vehicle. Um, for, one of the things I've always thought is really good about Orion about our design is that it's really pretty flexible and we can accommodate changes like that uh, and let the vehicle design evolve. I'd like to talk a little bit about that vehicle design. What, how is it laid out on the inside uh, for the crew, and, and can that be changed depending or mission specific? It can. Uh, it is uh, adjustable. Our, I'll say, our standard design, if you want to call it that, uh, is uh, set up for a crew of four, um, and uh, the, the commander and pilot uh, are uh, their seats are located. Uh, in the launch and entry position, basically underneath the control panel. There's three control panels that uh, that we use now, uh, only three control panels that are used for the control of the vehicle. And then the other two astronauts, uh, if you want to call them mission specialists, uh, sit basically down at their feet. Uh, you're on, sitting on your, if you think of it, you're sitting on your back uh, looking, looking up in the launch uh, um, c- configuration. Um, we do have the volume to put two additional seats out there and carry six. Um, they're basically out on the, the, I want to call it the wings or the edge of, of the capsule. If you remember, Apollo was sized for three, and so our normal uh, suite is four. Um, for, and just like the shuttle was, depending on what the mission requirement is, you'll adjust the crew. Uh, you know, it's, it's always an interesting balance between numbers of crew and the, the consumables and you know the volume for food and science that that and that they would need uh, versus the the mission requirements and you know if you if you don't have to carry if you could if you could get a mission by with only two astronauts you'd consider that because then you could apply that mass and volume uh, to other science but once you get on orbit the seats that they sit in basically are broken down um, they're and uh, folded up and broken down and pushed to the sides so that you've got the, basically the whole opening, whole volume there for um, effective work and living space. And that, that work and living, is, I mean, is, is it a tight squeeze for these four astronauts, or, or, do they, or do they have some room to breathe and, and stuff like that? They've got room to breathe. Um, it is, um, I have, uh, here at JSC, We've got our mock-up uh, on the floor, and we also have a Soyuz mock-up on the floor. You know, uh, comparing those two, it is roomy and spacious. Um, now, for a, a mission to a destination like Mars, the capsule itself isn't going to be your only living volume. We would uh, fly and connect with, you know, another I'll call it a transit uh, system or some kind of a habitation module. And if, if you think of space station and the volume, the living volume that you get inside of a space station uh, type element today, you'll have something like that uh, in addition to Orion uh, for you know, your transit uh, to on a, on a long, long mission. But for a relatively short duration, our mission requirements really, we talk about a 21-day capability for four people. That's how we size a lot of our systems. Um, you know, it can handle that. Um, you know, it's um, it's not like driving a forty foot Winnebago around, though. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So, you know, I've been doing some reading, and and you know, it's been said that that the engineers that work on Orion, they're using best practices learned from you know the Apollo capsule and the shuttle. 
Um, what are some things that you've taken from from these two spacecraft um, that you've put into into practice in Orion? First one that pops into my head is on shuttle. One, uh, if you look at the, the the thermal protection system, the tiles, uh, the black tiles that are on the vehicle that are um, from the shoulder up or from the heat shield up to the top are uh, a derivative of the space shuttle Tuffy tiles. Uh, the Tuffy tile were part of the tile system that we used. Uh, they were very successfully used, particularly towards the end of the shuttle program. And uh, and we've carried, the, they've got the right solution for us, right technical solution for us, uh, for the back shell, what we call the back shell portion of the vehicle. Um, now we also, if uh, for people that are really familiar with shuttle, Remember how much effort went into installing those tiles on the vehicle, and you know the up and placing them on the vehicle, and it was a very time-intensive effort. Um, the Orion designs evolved from some of those lessons learned. We actually take the the tiles and install them on a set of panels we call back shell panels, and do that in parallel operation on the bench, uh, off to the side, and set them up. And basically, from a schedule perspective, allows us to be more efficient and and deconflict that tile installation work with other work on the vehicle, and then you get those panels completed and late in the assembly process, bring an entire panel in and bolt it onto the vehicle, um, and uh, go from there. So we've, you know, like when you talk best practices, the, that tile solution works really well. In fact, some of the same very same technicians that worked on the shuttle are now working on Orion. Uh, when I was down at the Cape before EFT-1, I can remember talking with them. And, all right, so they took those lessons that they've personally learned and have, and have been able to apply them. Um, you know, relative to uh, Apollo, uh, we have the same shape. Um, that and The agency looked at other shapes. We, we looked at, did a lot of trades early in the program and ended up settling on that blunt body shape. There's a lot of heritage I like to say that physics haven't changed. Uh, reentry heating is still reentry heating, um, and um, we are actually able to leverage um, by maintaining the shape, which is really maintaining the cone angle, allowed us to look back and maintain and utilize some of the database that Apollo had, and apply that, and allowed us to. And we still had to do plenty of wind tunnel and. Um, arc jet and thermal protection type tests, but we had a starting point that we could leverage off of. Um, and, uh, and so we we took advantage of, of that Apollo heritage. Um, and then one other Apollo, this is just a personal one, that I work on parachutes, and our parachute system um, is sized and designed for, for Orion. We actually have, uh, we call them graybeards, one of the guys that worked on Apollo as an engineer, is, is a consultant on our parachute team. Right? And he worked Apollo parachutes. He actually consults with us uh, as an advisor on our current team. Right, And so his lessons learned from design as well as testing and the surprises that they saw, uh, we've been able to leverage off of and, uh, and take advantage of. You know, one of the big debates we had in our parachute world is how many, because parachutes uh, and the deployment of them is a, Pretty, we like to use the term chaotic event. Um, you know, each, each of the three main parachutes is 116 feet in diameter. And so you got these, the, to get them out of the vehicle and properly inflated is not a trivial thing. And how are those parachutes deployed? There's um, actually a series of 11. There are, um, the first ones that come out are the three small chutes that are on the Ford Bay cover. And uh, they are deployed by a mortar. So you got a small pyrotechnic charge that uh, pushes, you know, the, is commanded to fire, and it pushes the parachute out the out through the mortar. They inflate, take the capsule or take the Ford Bay cover portion of the vehicle away, get it out of the way, and then we immediately have a mortar deploy two drogue parachutes. Um, they go through their reefing sequence and start to decelerate the vehicle when. The, and at the appropriate timing, we actually cut them away, and then there are three small pilot parachutes that are mortar deployed, come out of the vehicle, and there's actually a, a, a link, a Kevlar link between the pilot parachute and the three main parachutes. And so the, the three pilots inflate, pull the three mains 
uh, out of the bay of the vehicle, and then they inflate on their own. Stu McClung, the, all of these systems that you're talking about, um, we talked about the, the tiles, uh, the, the shape of, of the capsule, and, and the, the chutes. These were all tested, um, you know, December of 2014, for that first test flight. How did it fare? How did all those systems fare, and, and is that what you were expecting, and what's, what do you need to kind of tweak after, after that test? Yeah, so EFT-1 um, was an excellent uh, mission for us, uh, very, very successful. And we reached uh, an altitude of 3,600 miles, uh, and we intentionally went out that uh, to that distance to expose the avionics to uh, the radiation that you see as you go in and out through the Van Allen radiation belts, and they performed um, flawlessly. Uh, it gave us a reentry heating that... Uh, that you we haven't uh, can't uh, can't create in a lab, um, and the tile system and the heat shield work splendid, uh, splendid results, great data. We had 1,200 sensors on the vehicle and gathered uh, uh, an enormous volume of data to use. Um, parachute system worked um, just like we pl- uh, just like we predicted. Uh, you know that's one of the big things we do on these flight tests is. We we do as much testing as we can in the lab, uh, or even on the bench, uh, or on the ground somewhere, and then you string, put all of this together, and you put the vehicle through a a full up set of uh, real total flight environments. Uh, we call it test like you fly, and because uh, uh, you know our parachutes, as an example, the parachute sequence starts 25,000 feet, and when we test our parachutes independently, we uh, use a C-17, and so we get on to, the parachutes get on to test condition somewhere between 25 and 15,000 feet, depending on the test we want to accomplish. And so EFT-1 gave us an opportunity to deploy the parachutes at the planned altitude and the planned um, uh, entry velocity. So we were able to combine all of you know, all of these different test scenarios, and really, we tried to stress the system, and um, we we hit all of our test objectives. Um, you know, the only real anomaly we had on EFT one. Uh, anybody looks at the photos of the vehicle after it landed, after it landed during recovery, you'd see uh, two big orange bags. Um, we didn't have a. There actually are a total of five. Uh, what we can call these uprighting system bags, uh, and. Uh, Two of them deployed properly. One of them deployed partially, and the other two didn't. And so we we did not. We know we had proper pressure. Uh, the the system, but we uh, the system blew down. The pressure system worked properly. The bags developed some leaks as they were deploying out of the, the vehicle gussets. And so that was our only real anomaly that we had. And uh, the team has been working through that. Uh, Basically, to to learn from that and refine the design, um, toughen up those uh, inflation bags so that we don't see that problem again in the future. What what are those bags for? Are those to keep the um, the the capsule upright while it's in the water? Is that what they're for? That's they're to keep it upright, and it's really to upright it. Uh, the history from Apollo is that a capsule of this shape will land and uh, one, and just by how it lands on the waves and its motion has the the tendency to flip upside down. Uh, when it goes upside down, we call that position stable two. Um, you inflate the uprighting bags. Um, they, it's a helium system that blows down out of small tanks into these bags. The bags inflate, uh, and it changes the the moment of buoyancy of the vehicle and causes it to rotate back around uh, and go into the upright position, which you call stable one. And so you deploy all the bags. The bags, by design, are fault tolerant, uh, just like most all of our systems. We design them to design the systems to withstand a failure. And this was a case we had tested those bags numerous times at the uh, neutral buoyancy lab here at the at JSC and on the bench, and they'd worked fine. And this test flight, you know, we learned something about them, and they, we didn't get all five of the bags out. All said and done. Very successful uh, test flight from from all the people that I've spoken with, um, but um, that 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 flight originated off of a, a ULA a Delta Delta Four Heavy. Uh, they're still developing the space launch system. What kind of challenges do you run into, you know, developing a capsule and developing a brand new launch system? Kind of 
parallel to each other? It's going pretty well. Um, you know, we're th- we've finished our critical design review. Um, SLS, I believe SLS has finished their critical design review. Um, the biggest, from a hardware builder's perspective, the the biggest challenge is as you're developing those um, big big pieces of your infrastructure in parallel. A uh, critical thing for somebody like me is understanding my environments and what I have to build the hardware to survive. Uh, as the rocket is being built, uh, the the vibration environment, as an example, uh, as they get in, as we run t- run tests and analysis, that vibration environment uh, will get refined. And if, as you understand that process and and the refinement better, if those loads change or if those loads go up then our hardware f- folks um, have to react and, you know, have to design accordingly. And so it's that's always a challenge when you have this parallel activity of how early do you start building, you know, whatever your system is, parachutes uh, or the mortars, um, versus getting the, the I'll say, the, the really refined flight data. And because uh, you know, you're wanting to get there as quickly as we can, uh, and so you make a best judgments on what the the load environment's going to be, and you get started, and then you adjust and modify if you have to. Right. Uh, otherwise, from a overall configuration and the the, prog- the different elements of the program working together, uh, it's it's really going pretty well. Um. So, next uh, next test launch EM1 um, date we're looking at is what 2018, I believe, or, or before. Um, can you kind of explain what that mission is, what uh, what engineers are, are hoping to accomplish, and uh, what you're looking forward to? So that'll be the EM1 is the next mission where Orion uh, will get our uh, our next test flight, and it'll be the first flight of the space launch system. And so it'll be the first full-up test flight of the entire uh, system. Um, from an Orion-centric perspective, uh, EFT-1 was great. You know, we had a couple of, we had the orbits of the Earth, but uh, for EM-1, we will actually depart uh, and go out and loop around the moon and go out uh, beyond the moon and uh, allow us to take the vehicle and um, and put it through its paces, both relative to the space environment that it'll see, the thermal environments that it'll see on orbit, bring in extra um, extra tests relative to the communication system, guidance, um, you know, to take those, take those next steps that basically p- prove out the, the, the readiness uh, for EM2, which will be the first time we put crew in it. What, what are you really going to be keeping your eye on for, for the next, uh, next year's uh, prepping for this? What, what's your focus? Yeah, for the, near, the focus for the next, um, I'll say, 6 to 12 months, um, there's many of us, many of us engineers across the, the program, that uh, we're building up our hardware, and uh, we'll basically build up the vehicle again. We'll build up the next uh, Orion crew module, and, uh, and so that's really my focus over the next six to twelve months is making sure that all the hardware that I'm involved with is holding to its schedule. Uh, is you know is meeting its technical capabilities and you know, so there's uh, a number of us out here running in parallel uh, feeding our hardware down to the cape as we start building up the next crew module that uh, eventually uh, towards the end of the calendar year 16 or early in 17 uh, will end up being shipped up toward up to Plumbrook for uh, a full up vehicle test uh, ahead of integration onto the SLS booster. Uh, for EFT or for the EM mission, um, what's what's kind of the benefit of having all of those components being assembled at the launch site? You've got a production line, right? You've got the I have the, the the primary structure, the pressure vessel there, and when you bring all of your other hardware in and funnel it down, and you've got a singular workspace, uh, there's an efficiency that comes out of that. Uh, there's always you build it up the first time you build vehicles there's always some challenges uh, you know these are not this is a complicated vehicle and so there's always challenges along the way the fact that you have all of this hardware sort of co-located and the the, the teams that are supporting it 
co-located as you need to allows you to adjust and adapt and uh, make the best use of your time, uh, allows you to quickly deal with an, you know the problem that comes up. Um, yeah, and so you sort of think about controlling your own destiny. Uh, you know, you're not waiting. You're not you're not held up waiting on somebody else to get your job done for you, right? So it's it's incumbent on uh, us production side engineers to get our parts down to the Cape so that Scott and the Lockheed production team down there can uh, take this vehicle and get it assembled and, and get it ready for the next step. I've been speaking to Stu McClung. He's an Orion engineer. He joins me by phone from Houston. Stu, thank you so much for chatting with me. My pleasure. Have a great day. Well, that about does it for this episode. Next time, we'll take a look at where the Orion capsule is being put together. NASA's Scott Wilson gave me a tour of the operations and checkout facility at Kennedy Space Center. Support for Are We There Yet? comes from the listeners of WMFE. You can follow the show online. We're on Twitter, at AWTYMars, or reach out to me in the Twitterverse. I'm at SpaceBrendan. Are We There Yet? is a production of WMFE. Find more space news online at WMFE.org space. I'm Brendan Byrne. Thanks for listening.